I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Phil Schauer, um, who's going to talk to us about um, bariatric surgery for type 2 diabetes. Phil? Great. Thanks, Stacy, and good morning. Good morning to all of our participants on our network, as well as um, our international audience who are participating on our live webcast. I'll be talking to you today about the role of surgery for treating uh, type 2 diabetes. This continues to be quite um, a hot topic in our field. I'll be talking about some of the, the new evidence, and it seems like almost every month a new a paper begins to um, uh, show new evidence about this field. So I'll start by uh, summarizing a very recent paper that our site here at Cleveland Clinic um, uh, participate in. This is the three-year outcomes of the Stampede trial, and this is a trial comparing two types of bariatric surgery, sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass with intense medical therapy for treating diabetes, and this was presented on March 31st at the American College of Cardiology in Washington, D.C., and it was also simultaneously published in New England Journal of Medicine on March 31st. Uh, the only relevant disclosure is the fact that Ethicon Endosurgery uh, was um, a funder of this um, study as well as uh, NIH. So to begin with some background, I think the audience is quite familiar with the fact that type 2 diabetes is a major uh, epidemic in our country and throughout the world. 25 million Americans have uh, type 2 diabetes, but less than 50% are actually um, in good control in terms of uh, tight uh, blood sugar uh, control. Uh, many observational studies have shown that bariatric surgery, bariatric surgery can result in significant improvement in glycemic control and cardiovascular risk factors. And just within the last two years, several short-term randomized controlled trials have validated these facts that have, we have seen with observational studies. But what really is missing is uh, data from randomized controlled trials uh, demonstrating the durability of this effect uh, of surgery. So uh, we had published just uh, two years ago in New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 the initial results of the Stampede trial, uh, which had follow-up up to 12 months, and it showed uh, quite significant superiority of both procedures, the gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, compared to intense medical therapy at achieving um, tight glucose control defined as hemoglobin A1C of 6% or less. So the data that I want to summarize to you this morning is really the intermediate outcomes, the follow-up at, at three years from the study. And I will hasten to add that this truly was a multidisciplinary study that included a variety of expertise here at the Cleveland Clinic, particularly endocrinology. Dr. Sankita Kashup um, was our uh, primary endocrinologist who really took responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of our patients. We also had cardiologists involved, Dr. Steve Nissen, who's the chairman of cardiology here, uh, Deepak Bott, who's a cardiologist and formerly at the Cleveland Clinic, and then a variety of other um, specialists, including uh, surgeons, basic scientists, um, statisticians, and so forth. Now, the endpoints uh, are shown here. The primary endpoint was the success rate at achieving a fairly aggressive target of hemoglobin A1C of 6% or less. And you can see here the secondary endpoints, including uh, changes in fasting plasma glucose, lipids, blood pressure, a body mass index. We also looked at non-invasive uh, uh, evaluation of atherosclerosis, known as the uh, carotid intermedial uh, thickness measurements. We measured changes in medication usage adverse events, and also quality of life. So let me first describe to you what the intensive medical therapy. Now this is above and beyond sort of standard of care therapy. We did indeed follow ADA guidelines in terms of standard of care therapy for all patients in all three arms of the study. In addition, patients, particularly in the medical group, also received a fairly potent um, and modern pharmacologic agents, including, including insulin sensitizers, GLP-1 agonists, sulfonylureas, uh, multiple insulin uh, injections, with an intent to 
reduce their A1C down to 6% or less. They also had frequent visits with uh, nutrition, psychology, and endocrinology staff over the course of the three years. In fact, in the first couple years, they met every three months with an endocrinologist and at least twice a year beyond uh, that, those first two years. So fairly intensive uh, medical regimen. These are the two operations which I'm sure the audience are quite familiar with. Gastric bypass, the sleeve uh, gastrectomy, using fairly standard laparoscopic approaches. This shows you the flow of patients. This was a randomized trial with three arms. We had 150 patients that were randomized into these three different groups, and these were patients with fairly advanced type 2 diabetes with an A1C at least greater than 7%. You can see the body mass index range there in age 20 to 60. And the groups included intensive medical therapy alone, intensive medical therapy plus gastric bypass, and medical therapy plus sleep gastrectomy. And at the end of three years, we had this population for analysis, which represented about a 91% retention rate at three years. This shows you the baseline characteristics. I'll simply point out that this group had fairly advanced type 2 diabetes. You can see here that the average patient had more than eight years um, of diabetes. Average patient had hemoglobin A1C that exceeded 9%, which clearly would be considered relatively poor control. The average BMI was 36, but about 36% of our patients had a BMI less than 35. Patients were highly medicated, so this is poor control on multi-medical uh, therapy. Average, average patient had more than three diabetic drugs and about half or close to half were on insulin. Patients also had a number of other comorbid conditions including depression and many other comorbidities and somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of the patients already had some degree of microvascular complications such as neuropathy or nephropathy. So fairly advanced diabetes. Now, this slide summarizes the key um, primary and secondary endpoints that were statistically uh, different in the surgical versus the medical group. Now, the primary endpoint is shown at the top first row here. This shows you the percentage of patients in each arm of the groups that actually achieved the target of an A1C of 6% or less. Remember, the starting or baseline was above 9% in all three groups. So in the medical group, this was achieved in 5%, gastric bypass, almost 38%, sleep gastrectomy, 24%, and the surgical groups were highly statistically um, significant in terms of a greater likelihood of achieving that primary endpoint. Now other interesting endpoints are the following. The patients that actually achieved that endpoint without requiring any medications, as shown in the second row. None of the patients in the medical group achieved that, and it's no surprise. After all, this is really based on pharmacotherapy. But nearly all the patients who had gastric bypass who met that target did so without the help of insulin or any other oral agents. And this is also true, but to a lesser extent, with sleep gastrectomy. Now, what about the patients that actually hit the more conservative ADA target of 7% or less. And here, too, you see um, a um, greater success rate for both surgical procedures compared to the medical therapy. We saw changes that favored surgery in terms of changes in fasting plasma glucose from baseline. Uh, also, the relapse rate, that is, patients that actually hit the target of 6% or less but later um, had some degree of recidivism. We see this occurred in 80%, nearly all of the patients who had medical therapy, but to a much lesser extent with gastric bypass um, and sleeve gastrectomy. Surgery was also had a greater effect on uh, changes in HDL cholesterol, which is hard to manage pharmacologically. Also triglycerides, as you can see here, um, as well. We did not see any significant differences with respect to carotid intimal medial thickness changes at the two-year mark, which is relatively early to expect any changes there. Now, notably what's not on this graph 
is uh, blood pressure and um, uh, cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. There were no statistical differences between the medical and surgical groups and those parameters. However, there were significant reductions in antihypertensive agents as well as anti or, or lipid lowering agents in the surgical group compared to the medical group. Now, you may be wondering what were the factors that had predicted patients achieving the primary endpoint. And we looked at a lot of factors. I know this graph is quite complex, but we only found that the top two actually were predictors of patients who would achieve the endpoint or not. So those patients uh, you know, who lost a lot of weight, so the change in BMI was clearly a factor that predicted um, reaching an A1C with or without, an A1C of 6% or less with or without uh, drug therapy, and duration of diabetes. Those that had diabetes of eight years or less were much more likely to reach that target than those patients um, who had duration much longer. Now I'm going to show you the time course um, of a few of these uh, endpoints. This shows you the change in hemoglobin A1C over time. The medical group is here in yellow, sleeve gastrectomy, orange gastric bypass, blue. Now notice in the surgical group, very dramatic change, and this is the relative change from baseline. Uh, most of that change occurs in the first three to six months, but fairly well sustained out to three years with perhaps a slight degree of um, worsening over that three-year period. Now, in the medical group, the peak improvement occurred at about six months, but from that point on, despite continued medical therapy, in some case, increasing the dose of drugs, adding more drugs, adding more insulin, despite that, uh, we see a gradual worsening of their A1C such that at the three-year mark, there's just a slight benefit, about a 0.6, 0.7 uh, percent a change in A1C from the baseline. So fairly modest improvement at the three-year mark. So, so compared to the first year, there's actually a widening of that therapeutic gap between medical and surgical treatment favoring surgery. I think it's a very, very important point. Now the body mass index change is shown here. You see, again, not unexpectedly, a very dramatic decrease in BMI in the surgical groups. It's fairly well sustained. Notice that there was a statistically significant difference favoring gastric bypass over sleeve gastrectomy at the three-year mark. There was a more modest drop in weight in the medical group, about a two-point BMI change at the three-year mark. But fortunately, most of that weight loss in the medical group was sustained over that time period. Now, what about diabetes medications? In the surgical group, while they're improving their glucose control, they're also decreasing the utilization of medications. So you can see here, in terms of number of medications used per day, we see a gradual weaning of these drugs in the surgical group. And again, this was to a greater extent, statistically, in the gastric bypass compared to the sleep gastrectomy. Whereas, for the most part, patients in a medical therapy group continue to depend on uh, drug therapy, even though there was some modest degree of weight loss. And this shows you particularly the dependence or utilization of insulin in this time period. And almost all the patients, 90 plus percent of patients in a surgical group were weaned off insulin, whereas um, about half of the patients, 50% of the patients in medical group still depended on insulin to achieve uh, some degree of glycemic control. I think this is important because with insulin goes an impairment of quality of life in terms of glucose monitoring, uh, insulin injections, pain, and so forth. Now, this is an important point. Um, I think it was, that's worth discussing in further detail. Uh, how about the effect on patients with a lower BMI, BMI less than 35? Because we do know that actually a majority of patients with type 2 diabetes have a BMI between 25 and 35. And with today's insurance coverage standards, this means that most patients with type 2 diabetes would not be eligible for surgery because their BMI is less than 35. So in our study, 
36% of the patients had a BMI less than 35. So let's examine the effect on this lower BMI population uh, with the three-year intermediate outcome. And this graph summarizes uh, the patients who had a BMI uh, less than 35 as shown in the uh, uh, triangles here and BMI greater than 35 are the open triangles and then the corresponding medical groups are above. So you see that uh, patients who had a BMI less than 35 enjoyed a very similar improvement in their hemoglobin A1C as the patients with a BMI greater than 35. Okay, So I think this is a very, very important point. This is almost an identical response whether or not the BMI was a greater or less than 35 in this particular group. And this shows you the effect of BMI on change in body mass index, very similar to the previous graph. Patients with um, the lower BMI also had a significant change in their body mass index compared to patients who had a BMI greater than 35. And this shows you the effect of BMI on diabetic, uh, diabetic medication usage. Patients with a lower BMI, less than 35, also equally enjoyed uh, a significant reduction in dependency on medications, as did the patients with BMI greater than 35, particularly in comparison to those patients who had medical treatment alone. Now, it wasn't just the diabetic medications that were, were reduced, but the cardiovascular drugs as well. Antihypertensive agents, as well as lipid-lowering agents, were also significantly reduced. So look at the three-year outcomes, and you see that in the medical therapy group, most of the patients, 52%, were still on at least three cardiovascular drugs, while in the surgical group, most of the patients were either on no cardiovascular drugs or perhaps just one or two uh, cardiovascular drugs. So a significant improvement there in terms of dependency on cardiovascular drugs. We did look at uh, renal function over this time period. I think some of this data is a little bit uh, premature to make any uh, strong conclusions. But with respect to changes in albuminuria compared uh, to baseline, we did see that in the gastric bypass group, there was a significant um, uh, remission. Uh, eight out of 13 patients who had albuminuria at baseline had resolution. This was 61%, and this value was actually statistically significantly different. We did not see this to be true for the medical therapy group, although there was only a small number, only four patients in that group actually had albuminuria. Uh, so it's a sample size issue. And in the sleeve gastrectomy group, even though uh, this looks like a significant drop, this value was not quite statistically significant. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on quality of life because I think this may be perhaps the most, um, one of the most important endpoints. Because after all, uh, in medicine, what we're really trying to do is improve the lives of our patients. And so we used a a very, very, uh, very well validated instrument known as the SF36 uh, quality of life survey developed by the RAND Corporation some 25, 30 years ago that has been used in multiple different disease states um, and validated. We all know that patients with type 2 diabetes have a reduced quality of life quite significantly. Um, and the question is whether or not this can be improved after medical intense medical therapy or surgical therapy to treat a type 2 diabetes. So this is a busy slide, but let me take a moment to explain this to you. There are uh, eight domains of quality of life according to the SF36 survey. Four of them represent physical components, four of them mental health components. On the physical side, these include physical functioning, role limitations, bodily pain, and overall general health. On the mental side, these include uh, role limitations due to mental issues, energy fatigue, emotional well-being, and social functioning. And so these graphs show the percent change from baseline at the 36-month uh, uh, mark. And you can see, in summary, five of the eight 
parameters were improved in those patients who had gastric bypass. Physical functioning, bodily pain, general health, energy fatigue, emotional well-being. For those that had sleeve gastrectomy, two of the eight were improved overall. These include general health as well as energy fatigue. In the medical therapy group, none of these were changed from uh, baseline. There was no improvement in quality of life whatsoever, even though the medical patients did have some improvement in their weight and their blood sugar and so forth. And interestingly, this wasn't statistically significant, but notice that in some of these parameters, there was actually significant worsening in the medical group. Bodily pain, role limitations, emotional well-being, social function. And finally, uh, adverse events were carefully uh, tabulated. Um, there were really no major, major surprises here. There were no mortalities. There were no major complications that resulted in long-term disability or were life-threatening. Uh, there was a slightly higher rate of GI symptomatologies, but th most of these were fairly minor in the surgical group, particularly the gastric bypass group. Uh, we saw no differences in some of the key diabetic complication rates. Uh, I'll quickly point out that there were four cases or 4% in the surgical group that did require reoperation. One was for bleeding, one was for um, a leak in a sleeve that was treated surgically, uh, one patient had abdominal pain, and one patient developed gallstones requiring cholecystectomy. I'll also point out that. Uh, 16 percent of the patients in the medical group actually had excessive weight gain as defined by a 5 percent or greater body weight gain. This perhaps is due to some of the medications they were on to improve their blood sugar and we did not see any patients in the surgical group have any weight gain whatsoever. Now you might be interested in uh, addressing the comparison between gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy. Let me point out, first of all, that the study really was not powered sufficiently to detect fairly modest differences between the bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. However, we did see some differences here, favoring in particular the gastric bypass. There was a greater success rate in achieving an A1C of 7% or less with the gastric bypass, that's without medications. The gastric bypass also achieved a greater reduction in uh, diabetic and cardiovascular medication requirements. A gastric bypass also led to a greater weight loss and also a greater improvement in quality of life. Now, were there any factors that favored the sleeve gastrectomy over gastric bypass? And the answer to that is no. Now, I'll hasten to add that many of us think that the sleeve gastrectomy, because it's less invasive than the bypass, has advantages in terms of reduced <clears throat> overall morbidity. And our study simply wasn't powered um, sufficiently to address small but, significantly, small but clinically significant differences in complication rates. Now, uh, there are limitations in the study. Uh, first of all, this is a singer, single center uh, a trial. Multi center studies um, often add to the uh, generalizability of such um, outcomes, uh, so that one has to keep that in mind. And secondly, uh, the study was powered specifically for these surrogate markers, um, such as blood sugar control and blood pressure, and it was not powered sufficiently to address some of these important clinical endpoints that are very important, such as cardiovascular events, heart, uh, heart attack, stroke, uh, mortality, and or microvascular complication. That simply would require a much larger sample size. So let me summarize the uh, Stampede study with three-year outcomes. The study showed that bariatric surgery is more effective than intense medical therapy in achieving uh, the glycemic target of A1C of 6% or less. It appears that weight loss um, in this study was a primary determinant of this outcome. Many of the surgical patients also were able to reduce their dependency on 
diabetic drugs as well as cardiovascular drugs, and in particular insulin. There were other benefits in terms of um, improving uh, metabolic uh, uh, disease, that is uh, improvements in HDL, cholesterol, triglycerides, obviously weight loss. Uh, these were all important cardiovascular risk factors that were differentially improved in the surgical group. And finally, and perhaps maybe even most importantly, very dramatic improvement in quality of life in the surgical patients compared to the medical patients. Now, before I finish, I do want to share with you that there have now been, as opposed to about five years ago, there have now been quite a number of randomized controlled trials comparing bariatric surgery to medical therapy, either to treat diabetes or uh, for weight loss. And I'll call your attention to a systematic review that was published uh, at the end of uh, 2013 that evaluated um, actually 11 studies. There have now been 11 studies, um, and many of you are aware of some of these, including the Mingroni um, Rubino study, the Acromidine study that was a multi-center study published in JAMA last year, and the Dixon and O'Brien studies, and several others. So these amount to almost 800 patients with a BMI spread between 27 and 53. Now, what's quite remarkable that is that in all these studies, there was quite significant consistency with the demonstration of surgery uh, being superior to medical therapy with respect to weight loss, glycemic control as measured by hemoglobin A1C, diabetes remission, improvement in triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, remission of metabolic syndrome, quality of life, and medication reduction. All these studies were quite consistent in showing these superiorities of surgery to medical therapy. Most of the studies showed that surgery did not result in a significant difference in blood pressure change or LDL cholesterol change compared to medical therapy. However, keep in mind that in most of these studies, the antihypertensive agents were reduced and lipid lowering agents were reduced as well. Fortunately, surgery was found to be safe in these 800 patients. There were no deaths, nor were there any cardiovascular events, such as life-threatening uh, heart attacks, um, strokes, etc. The most common complication of surgery was anemia. No surprise to this audience, about 15%. These are relatively mild degrees of anemia. And there was an 8% reoperation rate overall. So I think now we have quite abundance of data, 11 randomized controlled trials, although they're generally single center, relatively small studies, but they are quite consistent in showing superiority of surgery to medical therapy uh, for treating type 2 diabetes, particularly in patients who are not well controlled. So I think the evidence is quite, is, is quite uh, um, significant now, supporting this statement that bariatric surgery, especially gastric bypass and sleep gastrectomy, really should be considered as a treatment for type 2 diabetes, particularly in patients who are not well controlled on optimal medical therapy, and patients who are obese with a BMI of 30 or greater. And the data is quite strong, up to three years of follow-up, as shown here in the Stampede trial. So um, I think I'll stop there. Stacy, and perhaps we can throw this open for questions. Sure. Thanks, Phil. That was a, a great presentation, a lot of things to talk about here. Um, First, I'd like to go, I know we have one question in the queue, but first I'd like to go to Raul Rosenthal at CCF Florida. We may not, we may all actually have some video. Uh, Raul, appreciate your comments on the study and um, particularly relation, as it relates to the, uh, the sleeve and the bypass I issue. Um, so, Raul. Thank you, Stacy and Phil, uh, really outstanding, outstanding presentation. Uh, terrific study that I wish uh, will find support to continue in years to come. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that the meta-analysis and your study have shown that surgical treatment is superior to medical treatment. The problem we're facing now is, in America at least, uh, patients are walking to our offices asking us to get the sleeve gastrectomy instead of gastric bypass. 
So my first question is, if we go ahead and do a sleeve gastrectomy in a type 2 diabetes, based on this results, can we say that this is a correct decision, number one? Number two, uh, although it was not statistically significant, you could see that gastric bypass patients had a higher complication rate than the sleeve gastrectomy, which is something that we've seen across the patient population undergoing sleeve gastrectomy. If we move these patients to an elderly group that are more morbid and they have coronary artery disease, do you believe that the lack of complications might outweigh the weight loss seen with gastric bypass and prefer the sleep gastrectomy in the elderly? And my third question would be the role of C-peptide as a predictor of uh, success or failure. Uh, another intervention that working with bile acids in sleep gastrectomy patients so that we can get them to lose more weight uh, and achieve the same results at the years in gastric bypass. So three questions, and again, outstanding presentation. Thank you for your comments and, and response. Oh, so, Phil, um, sleeve gastrectomy, the right operation for a diabetic? Yeah, and first of all, thanks, Raul. I know that uh, you're abroad now in Europe somewhere, Frankfurt or something. We appreciate you calling in uh, with your comments. Um, yeah, so, Raul, I, I mean, I think, you know, the good news is we have two, you know, very effective surgical procedures, and you can even add to that to the duodenal switch, and which was not studied uh, in this particular study, uh, that are quite effective, and they have relative advantages and disadvantages, um, and I think we have to tailor that to our patients. I think um, in terms of glycemic control, in terms of improving the metabolic profile, I mean, the, the data is mounting that the gastric bypass has some clear advantages there. However, as you pointed out, uh, in some populations, the sleeve is probably a safer option. Um, and we also have to consider some of the longer term implications as well. Uh, so I think uh, we have to, you know, uh, take into consideration our particular patient and the risk benefit and apply that accordingly. But I think it's not, you know, an either or situation. We really have, you know, several surgical tools there that are, that are uh, showing you know, significant efficacy. Uh, and the second question again, Stacy was. Uh, uh, Rob, can you repeat the second question? I got the I got the C peptide question, but what was your second question again, please? Well, the second question. Well, the second question uh, still addressed that with uh, these operations in the elderly population, where he thinks that you know we should tailor the treatment. A young adult with type two diabetes probably should have a bypass that has a high BMI. An elderly patient that has low BMI probably should have a sleeve. Now it comes to the prediction of success or failure with C-peptide and the intervention we can use, medical interventions, to get the sleeve patients to maintain their weight loss when compared to bypass at three years. The role of bile acids, recently there's been publications with bile acids uh, that might participate in all these metabolic processes. Right, and I think you bring up some good points. Um, we did measure uh, C-peptide, Raul, um, and we did not find in our analysis uh, that it was a strong predictor of remission. In other words, if the, um, if the C-peptide uh, is low, which means low insulin production, um, we did not find that to be a strong predictor. Other investigators have shown that to be a predictor. In our study, it was only the amount of weight loss and the duration of diabetes that were uh, predictors. But your, your latter point also is important, mm -hmm. that is medications. And again, this should not be considered an, an either or. Many of these patients who had surgery still uh, did benefit from medications uh, to some degree. And so, uh, sure, combining these operations with some degree of um, anti-diabetic medications, um, lipid-lowering drugs, antihypertensive drugs can certainly uh, be beneficial. But we have to keep in mind that there is a tolerance to medications. And once a patient requires more than three or four drugs per day, you know, compliance rates go way down and side effects go way up. So there is a benefit in terms of reducing the dependency on drug therapy, in addition to cost benefit as well. Great. Thanks again, Ralph, for your questions and comments. Um, we have a question from Virginia Commonwealth Medical Center. If we can go to that site. Thanks for joining us. Listen, um, 
That was a great presentation, and I think all of us thank you for everything you've done to promote bariatric surgery and type 2 diabetes. And we also look forward to giving you a southern welcome here in Richmond tomorrow. Uh, so but my question relates to uh, what were the predictors of patients being able to go off medication completely? Did it have anything to do with duration of diabetes or weight or any other factor? Yeah, thanks, John. It's always nice to hear from you. And uh, I will be visiting uh, yeah. our friends in Virginia at the Virginia chapter of the ASMBS tomorrow at your annual meeting. I'm happy to do that. Um, yeah, so, John, it was the same. The, the, um, the factors that predicted um, a glycemic control and the ability to be weaned off medications uh, in our study were exactly the same. Now, remember, we're somewhat limited by our sample size, so there's only so much um, power you have with 150 uh, patient sample size. So the duration of diabetes, um, I think, is a, is a key factor, and that was highly statistically significant here. So I think at least part of the message is, is that if we want to try to achieve you know, a remission or get patients completely off the drugs, then we've got to intervene you know, earlier in the disease. And our data suggests that, you know, eight years is probably that key, that key endpoint. So hopefully we can, you know, convince some of our endocrinology colleagues to send us these patients earlier so we can get them into uh, remission or wean them off their drugs. Great. Thank, thanks for the question. And, and uh, we do have another question from McGill University. Now, they're joining us through the live website, so we won't be able to see them on the screen. Uh, but they emailed us a question uh, for Phil. Uh, any plans for future studies regarding uh, mortality outcome benefits compared to medical therapy? So any, any uh, expectation that we're going to see a difference in hard endpoints? Yeah, boy, this is something I, I would personally love to see. This is an extremely um, challenging type of study to do. They're very expensive. The best we have today is the SOS study. Um, and I think most of the audience are quite familiar with that. A study that started in the 1980s, has over 4,000 patients, 2,000 had uh, bariatric surgery, principally vertical band of gastroplasty, 2,000 had standard community medical treatment, and there was a significant reduction in mortality, cardiovascular event rate, cancer death rate, and even microvascular complications in those that had diabetes, which was only about 15 percent of that population. However, trying to do that study today would be difficult. The one limitation of the SOS study was that it was non-randomized. And so there are many critics of the outcome because it was not a pure randomized trial. Um, I would love to see a randomized trial conducted here, um, but it would be you know, very expensive and very challenging to do. I can tell you just randomizing 150 patients was very, very challenging to do. Um, in our single center. But I think it could be done, but it'll take um, a large funding source like NIH or perhaps multiple funding sources to do this. But there is a precedent. For example, the Look Ahead trial was just published, 10-year um, outcomes. That was a very expensive $250 million plus study to evaluate the effect of dietary and exercise weight loss on diabetes. It was a negative study. There was no clinical effect. Um, so I think it is time to address this. Um, hopefully we can get the politicians to make this a high enough priority. After all, diabetes and obesity um, are the most important public health problems of our time. And there's a follow-up question from McGill, uh, Phil, um, basically centered on what you just had mentioned. Uh, can you give us an update on where things stand in terms of a multi-center trial, uh, either in the U.S. or worldwide, um, with regards to you know, managing diabetes and obesity? Uh, anything, any movement in that direction at this point, or can you? Well, I tell you, I mean, who's most likely to do this? NIH, okay, because, you know, there, um, uh, there are no, you know, in the pharma world, if uh, there's lots of funds because of the large profit margin to fund such large studies, but there's no pharma driving bariatric surgery, and the medical device industry, nowhere near has the type of resources that pharma does. So you have to look to organizations like NIH. Now, the NIH did fund uh, some pilot studies. In fact, six sites, and Cleveland Clinic was one of those sites, that were funded four or five years ago 
to set up these very small pilot studies. And in fact, you're going to be seeing this year the results of some of these published. The University of Pittsburgh has a study by Dr. Corkulis coming out. The next it has been accepted for publication coming out very soon. Allison Goldfein at Harvard. Uh, David Cummings and David Flum at University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, they will all be coming out with their results soon, but they're very small studies. Uh, but to my knowledge, the NIH has not decided that it will invest in a large randomized trial. This is something that really ought to be done, and hopefully we can get, again, um, the political clout to push this forward. I actually have a follow-up question on that. So if that happens, what, what patient populations should we be studying? Should we be studying lower BMI, poorly controlled diabetics, or, or the standard higher BMI, you know, spectrum of diabetics that we see in our practice? What would you target? Well, I would target, um, you know, the, the core patient who has type 2 diabetes. And again, uh, a relatively small percentage have a BMI greater than 35, and that's our target right now. Most of the patients are 25 to 35. I would target that group. And there's some advantages in targeting the folks who have more advanced disease because you're, you're going to likely see um, a return on the impact much quicker. So you'll see a reduction that the event rate is higher, so heart attack strokes are going to be higher in that population, so you're likely to see a benefit early on, perhaps in a short five to ten year span as opposed to 20 years. Great. Uh, let's go to um, uh, Mount Sinai, see if anybody's there this morning. Dan there, good morning. Uh, I would welcome yeah, your Yeah, good morning. Hey, good morning. Dan, welcome your comments on the study, but also I was interested in, in uh, uh, your thoughts on the quality of life measurements. How important is that for uh, our field and convincing people that this is a good thing? The quality of life measurements are, are hugely important, but before I say that, let me just congratulate uh, Phil and your group on just an incredible study. Uh, it's so difficult to do a randomized prospective trial that involves surgical and non-surgical arms, and anyone who's done any type of prospective trial understands the difficulties involved. So congratulations on completing this. Um, looking at, uh, you, you know, one of the things that really struck me is uh, the benefit of gastric bypass versus the sleeve gastrectomy here. And it struck me here at Mount Sinai, about 80 percent of our bariatric procedures are now sleeve gastrectomy. And I think one of the things that struck me from your study is how gastric bypass clearly seems to have better results with regards to the diabetes than the sleeve gastrectomy. Um, currently, we ask our patients if they have diabetes or severe reflux, and if they have either of those two things, we push them more toward gastric bypass than sleeve gastrectomy, but ultimately, obviously, it's the patient's choice. Um, so uh, this made me kind of reconsider this, and, and in addition, it made me think about, you know, the issue of the eight to nine year cutoff point. If they've had diabetes for longer than that period, they're, they're less likely to improve, and maybe that should be another factor which figures into our algorithm of whether to choose sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass for our patients. Um, so uh, this, is, this is making me uh, reconsider my, my treatment algorithm for, for our bariatric patients here. With regards to the quality of life, um, that, that's another thing which really factors into the choice of, of gastric bypass versus sleeve gastrectomy, because as you mentioned, um, there are some long-term issues that come up with sleeve, uh, uh, with gastric bypass. There's a higher incidence of things like marginal ulcer, um, internal hernia formation, chronic abdominal pain, more so than you'd see in the sleeve gastrectomy. And, uh, clearly, uh, there's a benefit to surgical versus, um, medical arm. The question is, as we follow these patients out for more than three years, but five years or 10 years or 15 years, um, are there going to be benefits in the sleeve gastrectomy group that we, we don't in the gastric bypass group? Do you have thoughts, Phil, on that? Yeah, Dan, I think that's, I think that's a really important uh, uh, consideration. And, you know, in regarding your first point about the po popularity of the sleeve gastrectomy, I think a lot of patients, you know, they're concerned about safety, they're concerned about side effects. Um, and their perception is that the sleeve gastrectomy is so much safer and, and a lower side effect profile. But the reality it, we found in the, our study, our randomized study, where we have you know, equal patients in each group, that the same patients, that the patients that had gastric bypass, at least at three years, were happier, a lot happier. Five of the eight domains were improved 
in gastric bypass compared to the sleeve gastrectomy. And this includes, you know, those GI, you know, side effects and the perception of the uh, perhaps impaired quality of life that one might see with gastric bypass. So um, I think that we need to share this information with our patients that at least after three years, they're going to be happier. And why is that? Well, they have better weight loss. Uh, they're on fewer drugs. And believe me, getting off insulin, I think that's a key factor. Getting patients off insulin is a huge driver of quality of life benefit because once a patient's on insulin, I mean, they are really, um, they really struggle with the day-to-day -day activities you know, to maintain their insulin usage. Um, now, as you point out, what's going to happen over the longer time period? Um, you know, there are some studies suggesting that the you know, weight loss durability and glycemic control between the two procedures might even widen that, that gap favoring the gastric bypass. But you're also right that we have to consider the fact that there are these you know, low incident but significant complications of bypass, the internal hernias, the marginal ulcers that also might creep in long term as well. So I think this does require you know, further careful uh, consideration. But let's don't forget, though, that the target is treating diabetes and trying to prevent heart attack, stroke, and these horrible complications of diabetes. And that's critically important. Thanks, Phil. And Dan, I have a quick follow-up question for you. Uh, what's your what's going to be your strategy? As we're all doing more and more sleeves in the next five to ten years, certainly there's going to be patients that need uh, additional therapy um, who uh, to treat their their chronic disease of obesity and and diabetes. What, what's your strategy um, moving forward if for those patients with some recidivism or recurrence of diabetes, a switch or a bypass or medical therapy? Well. Uh that's a challenge. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, first of all, what do you do for the gastric bypass patient with diabetes recidivism? That's one issue, uh, and that's a very challenging problem. With sleeve, of course, you can, you can, go, to, uh, you can go to bypass. Um, you're not going to have tremendous improvements in weight loss, but you may have better control of diabetes. I'm, I'm very interested to see some of the newer studies coming out looking at some of the modified versions of the duodenal switch operation. Uh, some of the, the modified uh, loop versions uh, or long limb versions of the duodenal switch. We've had, uh, in the past, we've had a, a pretty big experience with traditional laparoscopic duodenal switch, uh, but the morbidity and the mortality rates have always been significantly higher than we've seen for the bypass, and for that reason, we've moved away from that quite a bit. Uh, hopefully, some of these newer operations that are coming out will have some of the benefits with a lower risk profile. Great. Thanks for your insight, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, we do have another question from Winthrop University Hospital, if we can go to that site. Good morning. Welcome. Hi. Good morning. Um, the question is, uh, because bypass does have recidivism and there's limited options for surgery afterwards, in the younger population, is sleeve a better option because it leaves room to do the bypass later if necessary? Uh, that's something I struggle with in the younger population because I, I see the recidivism in some patients, and particularly in women uh, and men as well, the options are limited afterwards. And so I recommend sleeve more often in the younger population. How do you, what do you feel about that? So the question is, for younger patients, is sleeve uh, a better option uh, so, you have a, a, you, so you have a salvage strategy as they get older if they do have continued diabetes versus doing a bypass on a younger patient? Phil, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, you know, again, I think it's a sort of philosophical issue. I mean, uh, with all other things being equal, why would you prefer an operation that's less effective to begin with? Uh, you're, if, if gastric bypass, as this data is showing, is more effective, you're going to have a relatively lower rate of relapse than with a sleeve gastrectomy. So why not go with the more effective operation first in a healthy population. And I do see an argument for a higher risk group to go with a perhaps less effective procedure to balance that, that risk. Um, I also would argue that you know, there is an option, there are options for gastric bypass. Um, there are options um, to modify uh, the gastric pouch, the outlet. Some of these are fairly marginal in terms of benefit. Uh, one can also 
lengthen the bypass, you can essentially convert a gastric bypass to a distal bypass, which is in many respects equivalent to a duodenal switch. Um, so there, there are options there. We just don't have a lot of data uh, to show right now. Uh, so I would favor um, you know, use the most effective operation to begin with, all things equal, rather than you know plan for a procedure that's likely going to fail where you have a relatively high rate of second op secondary operations, perhaps as high as 50 percent, I would imagine, with sleeve gastrectomy over the lifetime of that type 2 diabetic patient. Great. I think Raul had another question. If he's still on the line, Raul, you're still there? Uh, Phil, I wanted to know, uh, in your mind, what are, the, what are the mechanism of action of the sleeve? Because we still call the sleeve as a restrictive procedure, but you still have no, no exclusion of the duodenum. You don't bring the ileum up. Uh, so what is the mechanism of action? How is it possible that the sleeve is so effective uh, with diabetes when compared to the bypass when you have a duodenal exclusion and you're bringing the ileum up to the stomach? Yeah, Raj, you know, there's been a lot of work in this area. Uh, it would probably take another 60 minutes to, to go through some of the proposed mechanisms and theories. I'll just share with you that in our stampede study, we did do a sub-study analysis um, where we subjected uh, the first 20 patients in each arm to um, provocative mixed meal tolerance studies before and after. And these types of studies can indeed measure um, changes in insulin resistance and insulin secretion. And what we did find um, that both the gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy had a profound positive impact on reducing uh, insulin resistance, presumably driven by weight loss. And this has been shown by many other studies. But interestingly, we found that the gastric bypass, much more so than the sleeve, had a significant uh, impact on increasing insulin secretion by the beta cells. Um, and this is, was likely driven um, by um, GLP-1. We did find a dramatic increase in GLP-1 response to a meal, some five to six-fold greater response in GLP-1 secretion, you know, perhaps driven by this um, you know, duodenal uh, bypass uh, concept. Uh, we did see a slight elevation in GLP-1 with the sleeve gastrectomy, but not nearly as profound as with the gastric bypass. So this suggests that there's probably, you know, with these bypass type procedures, and this may also include the duodenal switch to some degree as well, that there's probably a dual effect. It's partially driven by weight loss, which decreases insulin resistance, and this gut hormone effect um, driven by GLP-1 or other incretins. And there's a host of other theories as well, bile acid secretion, um, you know, many other concepts out there that are floating that might explain how these operations work. Uh, obviously, a lot more work needs to be done before we really understand these procedures. And I, and I would just add, Phil and Raul, that, you know, that the mechanistic sub-study actually also showed a significant reduction in truncal fat for the gastric bypass patients compared to the, the sleeve patients. And that, uh, those changes and improvements in beta cell function and improvements in insulin sensitivity uh, correlated well with those decreases in truncal fat reduction. So there's something else going on with the gastric bypass, whether it's microbiome or bile acids or some yet undetermined factor that's driving that extra improvement. Um, the only you know, obvious difference is the flow of nutrients through the duodenum. So those are areas that a lot of us are looking at. But uh, a lot of work to do still in this area, I think, in terms of working from the bedside or the Bedside back to the bench. Right. I'll hasten to add to Stacey that, um, you know, based on the Mingroni Rubino data, the duodenal switch in terms of efficacy is superior to gastric bypass mm -hmm. in terms of glucose control and metabolic syndrome reduction. However, most of us have shot away from that for the majority of our patients because of the higher, you know, nutritional risk. But I do think that there is a population of patients where the duodenal switch is probably the best option. Great. I think uh, with that, we'll wrap up uh, this month's session. I sure, sure appreciate everybody's participation. Thank you, Phil, for a great uh, presentation uh, and sharing our data with, with the group.